I, I think in a way that was one of the first lessons for me too about uh, mental property history is, is how many people were involved. Obviously, as Kirsten was saying a minute, you know, millions and millions of individual members of the public, but also just in getting the thing going. Um, and I think, you know, one of the lessons, uh, I mean, it's a famous phrase, isn't it, that um, success has many parents, and, um, and make policy history definitely does. Um, I know several people who claim to have started it, and I'm quite interested to hear who Kirsten thinks started it. Okay, so where are we going to start? Just as I say, the history of equal history is profoundly contested, but there are some things that cannot be contested. Right? These are just indisputable facts for a set on the political change spectrum. So, equal history was an absolutely unprecedented outpouring of public concern about global poverty. We haven't seen anything on this scale in Britain before or since when it comes to high level public concern. Eight million people were the symbol of the campaign, the white band. Three billion people watched the Live Aid concert. So yesterday was the anniversary of the March on Edinburgh, which of course a million people took part in. But at the same time, there was a global cultural event taking place in nine countries, watched by an estimated three billion people doing something <laughs> political at the same time. The brand recognition of Equal History went from zero on the 1st of January 2005, over 90% by the Glen Eagle Summit. So in terms of scale, I don't think we've seen anything like that in British branding and comms and creative history. And we had nearly half a million people email with the Prime Minister. So we're also going to be interesting about that treated. Uh, yesterday, Tom Baker from Bond talking, uh, talking about how in many ways the Equal History was the first internet campaign. So in terms of digital mobilisation of the public, we were at an unprecedented point in history. So that's what we were trying to do on the other side, and the effect of it was. Okay, so these bits can't be contested because these are quotes from the actual communique from Glen Eagles um, against the four main asks that Make Poverty History had around aid, debt, trade, and HIV AIDS. Um, there are a lot of other commitments made at Glen Eagles too, and I'll talk about, about that a little bit um, later. But these were the main. The main promises made at Glen Eagles um, in response to those main um, four asks to make poverty history. Um, and then we say a little bit about how um, the world has done delivering against those, which actually can be contested because it's all about statistics and you can do a lot of different things with statistics. So not necessarily everyone would represent the delivery progress the way I will, uh, but I think it's reasonably fair. Um, and was done late at night at short notice. So, um, with that caveat, I'll show you how I think we've done. Um, so first of all, on debt. Debt was a really hard one to decide how to represent this graphically. So just one example here is that this is about the debt service that the heavily indebted, the 40 heavily indebted poorest countries um, were due to pay to the World Bank. And you can see at the right hand side that starts in 2000, when the Jubilee campaign started, we've got the line in the middle of 2005 and 2013, the latest numbers. So, go to the next slide. That's what it came down to as a result, really, of the Jubilee campaign and the bilateral debt relief that was started um, then. Um, and then Glen Eagles was mainly focused on the multilateral debt relief, so that's particularly the debt relief going, um, all the multilateral debts. The debts held by multilateral banks, like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, uh, the IMF, and that kind of thing. So if you see the next slide. So that's what their repayments came down to as a result of, of the deal that was done um, in 2005 um, by the G7 finance ministers. And um, I think that's about 90% compared to what they would have been paying by today. So that's uh, the impact on debt. Um, and we can go to the next one. So this is about um, the promise to get as, um, as close to everybody as possible who needed HIV treatment receiving HIV treatment. So you can see in red there, um, we had about 3% of the world's population who um, were living with HIV receiving treatment in 2004. This was the baseline for all of the um, learning promises. And 
Um, we agreed to try and get as close as possible to universal treatment by 2010. The yellow box is 2010. Um, so eight times as many people were getting treatment um, five years later, which is quite a big increase. Um, obviously, the number of people going living with HIV had gone up a little bit um, um, at the same time. So that, then you're up to about 20% of people uh, receiving HIV treatment. And today, the number of people receiving treatment has doubled again. Um, again, the number of people living with HIV has gone up a little bit, um, but it's going up pretty slowly these days. Uh, I think it may have peaked with it. Um, so now we're at about 38% of all the people who live with HIV are receiving um, HIV treatment. Um, so, not 100% yet, but that's the progress that's been made. And then the last couple of slides just about the A promises. Um, so they make policies both on Africa and on global aid. Um, so we'll just stay on the Africa one for a second. Um, so essentially it was a, a, an agreement to double the amount of aid for Africa. Um, and this looks a little bit more like doubling because of, of added in, re in real, real terms. Um, and so by 2010, it was just over, got to just over half of that. Um, which you can see in, in cash terms, it's about 44 billion. Um, and that's just stayed around there, that's it. Um, and then on globally, we get the next slide, please, Yvonne. Thanks. Uh, globally, a little bit better. Um, so the agreement was um, for an extra 50 billion in real terms, so that was actually almost doubling, this looks like, um, uh, once you add inflation and stuff. And by 2010, we got about two thirds of the way there. Um, and if you can see this, this graph goes all the way back historically. You, you can't really, you, there's a bit of an increase here in the mid 80s, it's quite a good up and slope there. But you can't really see anything on that graph that looks like looks like that. So we didn't, we're not there yet. Lots of countries not um, completely fulfilled their commitments. And obviously, very much too many countries are not at 0.7 yet. But a few years increase. Um, and sadly, there's not really a slide on trade because that's been a pretty sorry story. Um, we'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, so those are the bits that no one can disagree on, although Lord knows some people will try. But those are the bits that no one can really disagree on. Now we go to the bits that are highly contested. So if we start with the launch, that's what we got out of this campaign. But we wanted to go through this bit with you. Like, how did it come about? Why did this unprecedented popular mobilisation on poverty and this unprecedented political opportunity to do something about it, how did they come to a line? And the answer to that is really about the importance of alchemy. So, Increasingly data-led campaigning, we think campaigning and change is a science. It is to a degree, but there is a huge amount of art and romance and the stars aligning in making it work. So, a couple of things happened in an unprecedented choreography in 2005. The UK took control of the G8, so we were going to be chair of what was then still the most powerful world leader forum on earth. The UK was taking over the chair of the European Union at what was then still a highly functioning multilateral body. It was 20 years since Live Aid, which was the last height of popular engagement with global development. And it was the 20 year anniversary of Comic Relief, a really beautiful moment of the stars aligning around what the politicians had to do and what the public were likely to be talking about. That was brilliant in 2005, but we were highly dependent on those people who saw it coming. Justin, chief amongst them. So there were some people in late 2003 and throughout 2004 who saw this opportunity coming and didn't wait to engage with the world as it was going to be, but started shaping how they wanted it to be. So there was a long-term advocacy campaign to try and persuade the then Prime Minister to make Africa and poverty the centrepiece of that G8 presidency. That succeeded. Those private negotiations then came out into negotiations with the rest of the sector to let other people know that this opportunity had been spied, and that's when the, mo the movement started to be pieced <coughs> together. The coordination team was put together. That was highly political. That was worse than putting together a UN high-level panel by some 
margin. So the creation of the coordination team tries to bring together those organisations without whom this simply would not have been possible. So it wasn't the organisations that were easiest to work with, it wasn't the organisations that got on best, it wasn't the organisations that the government most wanted to work with, it was those organisations who, in the view of the chief strategists, it would have been impossible to do a mass public mobilisation without. So from the very beginning, the necessity for mass and mainstream was hardwired into how the campaign was designed. So we sorted the strategy. Now it's really important to remember this because this is what held it together, even though it got incredibly difficult and fraught towards the end. The reason the campaign didn't fracture despite the tensions was because from minute one, when you joined at a senior level, you were signing up to a strategy that was not up for negotiation. And that strategy said three things. First of all, we have to secure change. This is a real policy delivery moment. We're not in the business of talking about change. We're in the business of winning it. Secondly, this is an unprecedented chance to popularise our issues. This is no longer about keeping activists happy. This is about getting in the radio times, TV quick, in the sun. If we can popularise our issues and shift public opinion at this moment in history, we'll never be able to do it. And thirdly, that we have to leave the movement stronger at the end than we found it at the beginning. And those three strategic objectives held throughout the whole campaign. So we sorted the strategy, we sorted the team, and then we sorted the launch. So for launch, we were aiming to launch on the 1st of January, to say this is an unprecedented year. We had lots lined up for that. And then the Boxing Day tsunami happened. Now, that was obviously incredibly distressing for the country. It was putting enormous pressure on the main organisations in the movement because this wasn't just a campaign, this was a coalition of organisations that do first line emergency response. So lots of the organisations came under you know, extraordinary pressure. But it also, in amongst the tragedy and the grief <coughs> and the pain, what it did was help the public to understand that there is no them, there is no over there, there's only us. That these are issues that affect places we go on holiday, people that we have met on holiday, that there is no such thing anymore as different worlds. There was only one world in which we were all connected. So despite the Boxing Day tsunami and the grief and the pressure pressed on with launching in early January, one of the things we did for launch was Richard Curtis had produced a New Year special, Vicar of Sibley, into which he wrote the launch of the campaign. Now if you just think about that for a minute, that's straight to the heart of Mr. Britain, that's millions of people hearing about a political campaign in their pyjamas with their family. In terms of the mass and mainstream strategy, we could not have asked for a better launch. However, this was the beginning of what I will call the let's look a gift horse in the mouth behaviour that characterised the campaign. Because actually, having had this amazing offer from Richard Curtis, we then said, could we write it? Which, in retrospect, is insane that we would say to one of the most successful creative exports Britain has ever had, we'll do a better job of writing a sitcom than you will. We wouldn't let Richard Curtis write our policy report. It is insane that he was asked to let us write his television programme. But nonetheless, that says something about the sense of entitlement that the campaign had. That we were like, fantastic, we're going to get into Middle Britain and we're going to make sure that the messages are perfect. So that tension, making them perfect the enemy of the good, was there right from the beginning of the campaign. But in retrospect, let's never forget how special and amazing that was that we got to do something on television, right to heart, Middle Britain. So the lessons from this period for me are number one, go for who you need, who you really, really need. So involve at the beginning of the coalition only those people without whom it will not succeed. Everyone else can come later, but the most powerful forces have to be aligned at the beginning because you can't find them in later, and you certainly shouldn't find them in for those all sorts of organisations which are less politically potent and less necessary for strategy watching. You have to do that privately at the beginning. Secondly, you need to be really clear on letting people do what they are good at. Richard Curtis is an unparalleled creative force. He should get them to do that. We knew more about mobilisation on complex issues than anyone. We should be left to do that. Thanks, Jesse. <coughs> and, um, yeah, as you described, many, many people started making up the history, really. I don't think I'm going to pin you down to my name, so I'm going to try any harder. Um, 
I yeah, definitely wasn't involved uh, right at the beginning. I joined number 10 um, uh, almost exactly a year before Glen Eagles, um, around the time of the, the previous GA summit in Sea Island in America. And uh, it's actually literally, I'm it was empty in my first week, which was a bit weird. Um, and make was the issue as well at the way by then, um, as, a, as a campaign and an organization, if not in the public size. Um, just before uh, moving to number 10, I was uh, working in DFID, running the Afghanistan program and trying to keep Afghanistan as a top priority um, in the immediate aftermath of Iraq. So I, I really wasn't very aware of make policy history at that point. Um, the one thing I was aware of inside DFID was that this thing called the Commission for Africa had been launched. And to be honest, I think most of us in DFID weren't very involved in that, but just kind of heard about it and sort of talked to each other in the canteen, kind of wondered what on earth this was for. Um, and it's like, well, what do we need this new report for? I mean, kind of don't we know what Africa needs? It's like, um, and so I kind of came in to number 10, which had a very different attitude and thought that Commission Frank was a great idea, partly because it was Bob's and partly because it actually turned out to be quite a good idea, as I, as I learned, really. Um, because what it enabled us to do later on in the process, when we got to negotiating between the, the G8 countries and their Sherpas, their kind of main negotiators, it meant that almost all of the negotiation really was about are we willing to commit politically to what it takes to deliver on all these recommendations from the Commission Practice. Instead of us having a long, long negotiation between people who are not experts on these issues, about what needed to be done. Um, and if the UK had just come out and said, well, we all know this is what needs to be done, are you willing to do it? Then that would not have worked. That, that, you know, there would have been all kinds of contestation about that policy. But having um, a commission which at least had some representatives from some G8 countries, it might have been a good idea to have some of the others who weren't on the Commission for Africa involved, because they would definitely turn out to be the most difficult ones later on in the process. But anyway, it did give us this kind of policy um, uh, uh, grounding for the whole thing. And I think there's a real lesson in there for any campaign, which is to be really clear, uh, is the objective of the campaign to change a policy and challenge what the, the belief is of what needs to be done to solve the problem? Or is that agreed and the campaign is all about mobilizing the political will and the resources? to achieve what everybody knows needs to be done. And I think if you're not clear on that right at the beginning, you're less likely to be um, uh, successful. Um, the other thing I was just going to say is that if you also look back at the Commission for Africa and whether it succeeded, I think probably the best measure of whether it worked is how much of the Commission for Af Africa report got into the Glen Eagles communique. Um, and actually, unplanned, um, while we were there at Glen Eagles, I suddenly thought, actually, it would be rather good to compare these two documents. And so we sort of scrambled together late one night um, this sort of table that sort of listed all of the basic commitments of the Commission of Africa and then all of the commitments in the draft communique. And, um, and you can actually get that from a very good website that the University of Toronto has, which holds all of the information of all of the past G8 summits and ministerial meetings and stuff. And roughly about, there were roughly about 70 detailed recommendations in the Commission for Africa, and some version of about 50 of those got into the learning communicate, which I think is a pretty good record for the people who ran that commission. So that was phase one, how this campaign came to be. Phase two is the debt deal. Now, the debt deal was announced much later in the summer, but the story of it really started in February, where Nelson Mandela was in the UK to meet with the G7 finance ministers. So that was a great piece of theatre orchestrated by the then Chancellor Gordon Brown as a very strong signal that this was not business as usual. So this was not G7 finance ministers meetings as usual doing technical stuff. This year was going to be different. And if you want to make uh, finance ministers from other countries do a deal. One of the ways to exert moral pressure on them is to have the world's greatest living human come and speak to you. So uh, Mandela was over to address the G7 finance ministers meeting, but he also came to speak to 
proposed about 20,000 in Trafalgar Square. So the figure of Dimby introduced a um, campaign on the television and then in February we introduced it to a kind of what activist crowd uh, gathered in London. And uh, I would really urge you to Google Mandela's speech on that day. It's an absolutely astonishing feat of oratory. But I just want to read a tiny bit of it to introduce what the tone of the campaign felt like at that point. So he said, the G8 leaders, when they meet in Scotland in July, have already promised to focus on the issue of poverty, especially in Africa. I say to all those leaders, do not look the other way, do not hesitate, recognise that the world is hungry for action, not words. Act with courage and vision. Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, it's an act of justice. It is the protection of fundamental human right, the right to dignity and a decent life. While poverty persists, there can be no true freedom. Sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. You can be that great generation. Let your greatness blossom. Of course, the task will not be easy, but not to do this would be a crime against humanity, against which I ask all humanity now to rise up. Make poverty history in 2005. Make history in 2005. Then we can all stand with our heads held high. So you can imagine what sort of impact that had on the sense that this year was a window of opportunity that was closing. This couldn't be business as usual. This wasn't a little bit here and there, you know, classically at G8 summits, there would always be a bit of a need announcement, which Oxfam had once called peanuts for Africa. So there'd always been something, but there was a very clear moral sphere that 2005 could be different and it would be different. And that prefigures something we'll talk about later as to why the campaign shut at the end of 2005. There was a very strong sense from everybody that we had to socialise this idea that 2005 was a completely unprecedented in history. So that February meeting set up the deal that was then done in June, so the beginning of the negotiation happened at that G7 Finance Minister's meeting. Laurie will talk about that a little bit more. I think there's only two main lessons to be drawn from this phase for me. Number one is we focus far too much on the UK in how we designed the campaign. The UK Treasury couldn't do a debt deal on its own. It required the other capitals to play ball, but the other capitals were not feeling the pressure until much later in the year. So we had launched the campaign, we were trying to get traction, but it was only the UK representatives and all the different negotiating strands that were saying it was massive popular and public pressure. Other capitals just didn't feel it. And we were able to make them feel it by having Mandela give moral leadership, but if we hadn't had that, we wouldn't have really had any other source of pressure on those other capitals. And that was a great strategic failing of the campaign at the beginning. The second big uh, lesson of this phase for me is low barriers to entry. So we talk in campaigning terms about an engagement ladder and we constantly talk about people getting up the ladder of engagement and then we think that people climb ladders from anywhere other than the ground. You start on the first rung before you get up the engagement ladder and the thing that we're consistently poor at doing is working out what's the attractive first step that makes someone want to take the first rung before we get them high up. Mandela was the first one for us, it was what made people think this was special and different. But how do you think about that in every campaign we do? What's the first step that makes you turn from observer into activist? Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, that's interesting what you're saying about you know the exceptionalism of 2005, because as, as I was showing earlier with the, the, the graph on debt, the, 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 the work on debt really had started uh, back in 99, 2000 with the Jubilee campaign and the really big bilateral debt. Um, debt relief work. And I think one of the interesting lessons from that actually is that it took two G8 summits to get that done. So it started in Birmingham in 1998 um, when Claire Shaw was brand new uh, Secretary of State for DFID and there was an absolute, you know, another pretty amazing um, public mobilisation. Um, back in 1998 the Independent um, described it as uh, um, the biggest display of British solidarity with the poorest countries of the world since Live Age. You know, that's how that was also described then. And we had 50,000 people, you know, ringing around the around the summit. Um, but even then, you know, that, that summit didn't do it. it. Took another summit in Germany the next year to get it done. And several of the big things that that, that do happen, I think you have to be prepared for um, for taking them in bites and. Setting up the Global Fund on AIDS was similar to that. So that was the conversation around that was started in the Japan G87 in 2000, but it didn't get finalised until Italy in 2001. Um, now, 
Yeah, the, as Cassie said, most, most of the work inevitably on debt deals is done by the finance ministry. So we weren't intimately involved in all of those negotiations in number 10. Um, but there were a couple of things about that whole story I really remember. One is that the USA were the main holdouts on doing this deal on multilateral debt relief. And um, they wanted the World Bank essentially to fund its own debt relief, which was part of a bigger policy objective they had to really weaken the, the bank and reduce its own resources. Um, and then we're, you know, they're really on a, on a mission to turn the bank into a grant making rather than a loan making organisation. Um, whereas the campaign and the UK government and most of the European governments were clear that you know, debt relief needed to be financed with additional resources. We can turn back, talk a lot about what that word additional meant to different people. Anyway, the US would be very, very strong on that um, until pretty close to this um, finance minister's meeting in June. And so one of the things that made a difference was that after the May 2005 election, Blair began a kind of series of trips around the various GOP leaders. And we went to Washington DC literally about two or three days, I think, before the finance minister's meeting on the 11th of June. And um, uh, we really managed to get the White House to kind of um, trump the US Treasury and agree to put um, extra resources in to fund, fund that. And that opened the door to then getting the rest of the countries where the G7 finance ministers um, uh, did that, which is, yeah, I guess a good example of how um, Whitehall and all governments um, have different agencies with different views in and you have to find the ones that agree with you and get them to do some of the internal work in their own structures um, to make a real change. The, the other real memory about the debt deal for me was one of the most difficult things about the whole period. Um, so after this um, June um, finance minister's meeting where we had had this pretty amazing agreement um, to write off, um, as you saw on the graph, um, the multilateral debts of uh, 40 countries um, uh, to the three biggest, and it became four. We had another bank later, one in 2007. Um, and so we were sitting down with the kind of policy negotiating team in the policy industry after that. And we said, you know, we really think we're not going to get any more on debt relief. Um, NGOs that wanted a little bit more, they wanted a few more countries to be um, <clears throat> included. They, didn't, they wanted to change the OECD rules so that debt relief didn't count as aid. There were four weeks left before the summit. We said, you know, we're not really going to get any more on debt relief in the last four weeks. We think we should really focus our effort on the other asks that you, that main policy still, history still had around aid and around trade and around HIV. And in that meeting, you know, after a lot of discussion, the NGOs, in my mind, ag agreed that the priority for the remaining four weeks of the campaign had to be on these other things. We've done well on debt, we should move on. And yet, despite that, at the end of the summit, when the, you know, the judgments were made um, by the NG uh, NGOs on this, the debt deal was criticised quite extensively. And to me, that just really questioned um, the, the kind of openness and frankness that we've been trying to have with those uh, NGO negotiators in the process. And, um, and I think, you know, probably undermined a bit of the, of the trust that maybe we could have um, had, had going on more afterwards for longer. That said, um, the fact that we were even able to have a sensible negotiation with a, a sensible number of um, uh, representatives of, a, of an enormous NGO community by then was absolutely critical to make quality history um, having the impact that it had and, and having some precise impact on some of the policy goals. So I know how difficult it would have been for the NGOs to kind of um, uh, get together and decide who was going to be in that group and what their policy positions were going to be before they even came into the meetings room, meeting rooms with government. And that, that did work and it was really important that that, that was done. Um, nevertheless, there were times when um, some of the NGOs in, in those negotiating rooms had much, much more radical and really unrealistic aims compared to most of the people in the group. And um, so I was going to ask you, Kirsty, 
there, there were times when I was sitting there and went, wondering why you had to make the tent quite as big as it was. I mean, it was so big, wasn't it worth saying no to one or two? So just to put a bit of context on the um, thing that Laurie was saying about the debt deal having been agreed in good faith with uh, NGO <coughs> negotiators saying we think this is good enough and then uh, laterally in private saying good enough in public saying not good enough. There's two interpretations of this. One is uh, the generous one, which was uh, the public criticism was a piece of freelancing by idealistic uh, energetic People. The other interpretation is it was a drive by, uh, which was it was just if we say this in public, uh, other people in the coalition won't throw us under the bus. So, another interpretation is that people said we pushed in public to say uh, actually that it wasn't good enough, that the people who said it was good enough will be more inclined to protect us in public than to throw us under the bus and say these people don't represent energy, they are freelancing. And if it was a drive-by, it was quite successful because the, the gaming in the head that said we would stick by the more public uh, positioning turned out to be right, that we didn't pull back from it. In my view, we should not have had that public positioning from a freelancer or anybody else. Uh, and I don't mean freelancer in the sense of like a formal contractual relationship by me. Uh, people operating outside the operating mandate of the organisation. And so in my mind, we shouldn't have had it, we should have rolled back from it, and in retrospect, the tent shouldn't have been as big as it was, because we were very aligned at the top level uh, amongst the people that we really needed on board, very aligned on what this campaign was going to try and achieve, what its red lines would be, what success would look like. As we grew, other people did not sign up to that as forcefully, and they didn't bring us enough to justify that tension. So if we said, do you know what, we just can't do this without you, that negotiation wouldn't be worth it. But actually, uh, some of the forces that were most troublesome didn't bring us enough for that, pay, that, for that to get transaction costs worth paying. So on reflection, I think that was probably a strategic error of making a kind of sign-on campaign. Anyone could get involved in it. Once the tight uh, mandate was negotiated, anyone could get involved. Uh, we probably made a mistake there in terms of binding ourselves into constant paying of that transaction cost of working with people who didn't necessarily buy the fundamental premise or operating mandate of the campaign. So hands up, handedly, in retrospect, I think that's an error. Okay. Uh, the next phase is Live 8 and the March on Edinburgh. So Laurie talks to us a bit about how the Jubilee campaign had done the human chain around Birmingham. Our equivalent was going to be a white band around Edinburgh, so a human white band. So everyone dressed in white. We had assumed there would be about 100,000 people. We banged on 100,000 people, which would still double what happened in the human chain in Birmingham. In the end, we got a quarter of a million, so we smashed our own target by 150,000. Um, I am incredibly proud about how welcoming Scotland was to that idea that they were going to have this not only enormous summit with all the security implications of that, but they were going to have this mass demonstration with all the policing and security uh, concerns that that entailed. Scotland was for the most part incredibly welcoming, excited and participatory in that, apart from I led in organising the March on Edinburgh, so I actually quite a lot of the media around it, I found myself doing a radio interview with a very angry Edinburgh businesswoman who was saying that she had to shut her shop because it was on the route of the march and she was furious that the property industry was doing this to her. It was going to cost her all her money because her business was completely dependent on passing trade. I tried to be very sympathetic and pro-business and that, but it seems so very important that we had a demonstration. This whole interview about her passing trade and then eventually she said, what is your business, madam? So I sell brand pianos. <laughs> struck me as quite unlikely to be something that people buy in passing without balance of forethought. Um, but apart from the piano women, um, Scotland was absolutely fantastic about the fact that this march was coming. The march was months in the planning of negotiations with the police, with the local authority, um, the Scottish executive as then was, months in the planning. And then Bob Geldof happened. Uh, and I say that deliberately. Bob Geldof didn't make a decision. He happened to us as a force of nature. The campaign suddenly encountered Bob Geldof on a mission. Now, for full disclosure purposes, I went on to work for Bob Geldof. I didn't go on to work for Bob Geldof, and therefore I'm saying this 
I went to work for Bob Geldof because I say this. I went to work for Bob Geldof and I'm very firmly team Sir Bob because I don't think Britain has produced anybody else in our public life who has as consistently and as passionately made the case to the British public about what their generosity and power could do in the world. So was it a bit of a planning nightmare that Live Aid fell on our head on the same day that there was going to be a march? Sure. Was it administratively quite difficult? Of course. Was it politically 100% the best thing that's ever happened to make poverty history? I will take toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody who argues otherwise. It was a phenomenal boost to the campaign because we went from having a march that was going to be quite a million people in Edinburgh to having a global cultural event watched by three billion people. This went from being a national conversation to a conversation of our species about what we could do together to try and end the extraordinary grotesque injustice of a child dying every three seconds completely unnecessarily. There isn't anyone else on earth who could have made that happen. And that's why I'll probably be Team Bob till I die. My day, concerts in nine capitals, this still causes fights. Right, so uh, including one I had this week, one I had this morning. Uh, this is still a matter of really deep uh, passion and disagreement inside the movement. I'm very firmly on the idea that it was fantastic. I watched again last night and tweeted, uh, after Live 8, there was also a thing called the final push in Murrayfield, where Bob and Bono came back to speak to thousands of people in a massive stadium about the conversations that they've been having with leaders at Nine Eagles, and Bob just ended his speech by saying, how can these eight men refuse us now? How can they refuse us? And the reality, as you saw at the beginning, is they didn't refuse us. We won, but we wouldn't have won without that degree of popular mobilization and popular pressure. So the lessons of this phase for me are, this is what got us the pressure on other capitals. This is when this went from being a British campaign to a global campaign, from being something that our Prime Minister and our Chancellor were driving through negotiations to something where other representatives were feeling the pressure. The other lesson of this for me is the, my favourite banner at the uh, G8 March, in the Edinburgh March, was Tier Fund had this fantastic banner saying, we believe it's time for action. Obviously, pun the end, we believe it's time for action. But we are believers, this comes from a faith place for us it's time for the world to go on the long march to justice. Now the reason that was because of the movement for me is it spoke to a really deep tradition on these islands of faith mobilisation. We wouldn't have got Jubilee without the churches. We wouldn't have got quarter of a million people without the churches. So this was a really powerful knitting together of demographics for me. Church mobilisation, the long-termers, the people who've been at this for decades in Edinburgh, and new activists, people who would not be brought on board any other way down in Hyde Park for Live Aid. It was a really powerful, unexpected coalition that wouldn't have been possible any other way. And the third lesson of this to me is the option, so the next day, the front page I think of the Express or the People was a picture of Bono at Live Aid with the crowd stretching for miles saying three billion people can't be wrong. Okay, three billion people can be wrong. The mandate that this gave us to speak on behalf of the public would not have happened any other way. And crucially, the option was not perfect, detailed policy messaging on the front of the people or a picture of Bono. The option was a picture of Bono or nothing to do with poverty on the front page of the people. So there was some um, exasperation the next day. Well, the live aid messaging didn't go into the depths of what trade negotiators should be saying as part of the don't have development round. But then, no shit. Um, it was a concert covered by the tabloids. Of course it didn't have deep policy messaging. What it did have was messaging about justice, poverty, and our campaign on the front page of every paper in Britain and many around the world. So never let it perfectly be the enemy of the good. It's more important that people know that your cause is just than they know the very precise details of your task. Thank you, Kirsty. And I, I, I would say that in government we were um, as, as delighted, if not quite as passionate as Kirsty there, about the fact that uh, make poverty, that uh, Live Aid was going to happen. Um, it, uh, it was great um, what you were saying about it, giving it a, a new level of profile in the public, particularly in other countries, as you say, because make poverty history has been fairly UK focused, but we needed all of the GA countries 
to care about these issues. So that made a huge difference. Um, but the other thing it really helped with is, is keeping the nego negotiations open until the very last minute. The big struggle, really, that Justin and I were fighting inside Whitehall all the time was, um, well, you know, there's, there's only a couple of months to go before the summits. It, normally, we've kind of finished writing the communique by now, so uh, let's just kind of reach the compromise point with the rest of the G8, and then we know we'll all be done, and we can all turn up in Glen Eagles, and it will be fine. And so, no, 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 no. and, and um, and Blair and Gordon, you know, were, were definitely on for that strategy of keeping it open until the last moment um, as well. Um, but once it became known that a live was going to happen the weekend before the summit, then that became um, something that all of the Sherpas from all the countries, you know, could understand that we, we weren't, we just weren't going to compromise um, until the last day. And so we really did it, which was a bit unusual for, for G8. So it meant an awful lot of work had to be done at the summit itself. And I just want to tell you about a couple of them. So two of the really big um, uh, commitments that were made um, on HIV and on aid um, were held open uh, um, until Glen Eagles itself. Um, so first of, all, first of all, on AIDS um, and HIV treatment. This, I think, is the area where the Make Policy History campaign had the biggest impact, actually, on DFID policy. Um, going into 2005, organizationally, DFID did not think you could give HIV treatment to everybody who had HIV. Um, I think some individuals in that, uh, in DFID did, including in the HIV team, but definitely it was not the organizational view. It, that, you know, there was a a, quite a widespread view there, actually, that that would detract attention away from prevention, which was the only affordable way of stopping lots and lots of people getting HIV. Um, and it really was the pressure um, created by the campaign that brought, you know, first DFID um, and some of the other European countries, actually, probably there even before DFID was, that you had to uh, provide treatment, both as a kind of a human right, because if anyone can get it, why can't everybody who needs it get it? But also, for very practical reasons, which is why is anyone gonna come for testing, which is an important part of any prevention campaign, if, if being told that you had it was had no positive um, route out. Um, anyway, so that made a real impact on um, on DFID, um, and so then um, in the you know three or four months or whatever, um, running up to Golden Eagles, we were properly campaigning now on the Make Poverty History Ask of Universal Treatment for everybody. Um, and France, as I say, they were they were on board really early, but the US continued to have big doubts about it. Their, their strategy was much more about prevention, it was much more about trying to find a vaccine, which as you know is ongoing work. Um, and, um, and they just thought it was a totally unrealistic ambition, and um, they, so they weren't, they weren't wanting to, to sign up for that. So one, one night, a few, uh, a, few, uh, a few days before the summit, um, Justin and I were taking a phone call with the White House, um, which literally lasted about four hours. Um, and we were talking him through, um, you know, why this was so important and why having an ambitious target would get you much closer to universal treatment, even if you didn't think you would get there, than saying, well, we know we can only get 25%, so let's say 25%, and then you end up with 10%. And I kind of stole one of Bono's tricks of talking to him about, you know, USA said you'd get a man on the moon when you never thought you had any idea how you were going to get a man on the moon, but guess what, you say it and you manage to do it. Um, and um, Justin was kind of putting all sorts of expressions at me, you know, who is this guy? Um, and um, um, anyway, we eventually got him to agree to some wording which said we were as close as possible to universal access to AIDS treatment for all of those who need it by 2010. And he agreed to go back and get his government to, to sign up to that, and we took it around the rest of the G8 to get them to do it. And um, uh, the US agreed. 
Um, in the meantime, France did it. They said, no, that's still too weak, that's still too weak. So we had to have a, um, um, uh, uh, a conversation again with, with, with France and America. So the, the very first night after everyone had arrived in Glen Eagles, um, my French and American and counterparts and me, we went, we went for a drink and we flashed out this other form of words, um, which, which the French and the American guy thought, you know, would be okay and they could both agree to and that kind of thing. And so again, they were going to go back to their governments to see if they could get that definitely signed off. And I went um, back up to the kind of UK suite. And Hilary Payne, who was the different minister of the day, um, was there. And we kind of started talking about these new words that we agreed. And we both looked at each other and said, it is worse, it, this is worse than, than as close as possible. Like with some weasel word stuff, I can't remember the details. Um, so I just called up my US counterpart and said, look, don't bother asking anyone to approve these new words because I'm going to tell France you refuse to, um, to agree to them and um, if they really want to veto it against everybody else, that's what she'll have to do tomorrow. And so he said fine, he went along with that. And uh, that's what we did. And she actually didn't say anything. And that's why we ended up with the agreement that you saw up there earlier. And I think the big lesson from that, um, less, well, I guess I'd say, um, help the campaign helping us keep things open until the last moment is a lesson for campaigning there. And I think for negotiators, um, the lesson is, sometimes you really just have to, you do have to use that power of being the chair and being the presidency and, and holding the pen and deciding who you're going to listen to and, um, and sometimes seeing, you know, calling up people as well. Um, the other big decision, um, which we didn't finish until Glen Eagles itself, was on um, the aid increases, which you can still see up there. Um, quite a lot. Um, the European Union had got their kind of act together on what was announcing quite a long way in advance, partly because obviously the European Union has to. But a lot of the other G8 countries hadn't really made any announcements on how they were going to fund the Glen Eagles commitments until, you know, a day or two before they kind of got on the plane to come to Glen Eagles. Um, and we knew we had to add up all of these individual commitments into a single figure. So as what has been saying, so it actually communicated to people and so that people you know would understand it but also so that we had a number that we could hold the G8 to accountable for um, in the future. Um, but that was going to be very tricky at this last moment to do it. So the way we did it instead was we spoke to the OECD that's the kind of um, you know the repository of all development statistics and we said can you do a new forecast on what you think aid will be in 2010 based on all these individual commitments that the G8 have made? And the, the, the OECD had just, about two years before, got into starting to predict future, future aid flows. And luckily, Richard Manning, who had used to be the Director General of the PFID, was now the head of the Development Assistance Committee at the OECD. And he was very helpful. I think he was helpful because he believed in what we were trying to do, not because he... Um, owed a debt to the UK government, but he did believe in it. Um, and I'm not sure another uh, um, head of the, the DAC would have been as helpful, um, let alone as able uh, or willing as Richard to do the numbers and make the decision in about 24 hours. Um, and so between us, we calculated that these commitments added up to an extra 50 billion a year by 2010 which was the specific minimum amount being asked for by Med Poverty History, although they wanted it, you know, the next day after Glen Eagles, but five years was pretty quick. Um, so now we had to go around and get the G8 countries to all accept that we were going to put perhaps a slightly strange um, uh, phrase in the, in the communique, which said that on the basis of all of the commitments that the G8 have made, the OECD estimates that aid is going to go up by 50 billion by uh, 2010. Which is not, it's not exactly the GA promising 50 billion, but everyone knew that you know, by, by the time that goes through three journalists, that, that's what it's going to sound like, we promised 50 billion. So the GA were pretty uncomfortable with doing that. And um, so we had to start somewhere, we started with the US. Um, and so we had to have another one of these enormously long phone calls uh, with the US, um, our counterpart in the, in the White House, while he was literally on Air Force One flying to Glen Eagles, flying somewhere over Denmark, really, I don't understand that route, but anyway, 
Um, and we're doing this all on mobile phones. So I was literally using one on the mobile phone, burning the battery out while another one was charging, and then kind of constantly swapping between these mobiles. Anyway, eventually they agreed that they wouldn't block it, which was a good enough start for us. And um, it meant that we could then spend the next afternoon going around each of the other Sherpas one by one, um, saying why the OECD um, thought these calculations were fair, and saying, well, so far nobody else has said they'll block it. Um, so do you want to be the only one who's going to block it? And they were kind of said, no, I'm not going to be the only one who blocks it, even though they, they were going to be the second person who talks it. <laughs> but they didn't know that. Um, and so we progressively went around, and again, with a bit of that sort of bluff and brinkmanship, um, it worked. So, fine strike, shine. So this is the kind of emotional story of the summit. So Laura told you everything that was happening behind the scenes, how in community terms, like square brackets are getting raised and things are hardening up to be in a final outcome document. I just want to talk a little bit through what it felt like as a sort of week. So everyone was up in Scotland from the second, so everyone on the coordination team, everyone on the board was in Scotland for the Great Policy History Edinburgh, uh, March on the second. We were still there on the sixth when we saw the euphoria of London winning the Olympics bid, which just felt like such an incredibly positive national moment. But because we were all obsessed with our campaign, our first thought was, sure, I'm going to be pissed off or I'm going to get punished. Um, so how does that going to impact on the, the things that we're trying to finalise with other negotiators? Uh, when that news came through, the main board team were in with uh, Bono Bob Gerloff briefing them. Theoretically, we were briefing them on the negotiations. In reality, they were briefing us because they had much better access and intelligence and just had fantastic nose. They had brilliant political nose and how things were going to shake down, who was going to be able to influence who. That night, there was the big Murrayfield event that I talked about. It was a huge gathering in a Scottish rugby stadium. Thousands and thousands of people singing for Scotland, hearing uh, what was happening at the negotiations, feeling incredibly positive when we went to bed on the 6th, and then of course on 7th 7th, there were the London Bottoms, which was such an emotional high, it was such a deep sense, just like the tsunami of horror, of grief, of bereavement, of really deep anxiety for those of us that were in Scotland at the time, but had family in London, that theoretically you're there to do a job, but the job doesn't matter at all, and so you can eat your friends and family, and let everyone in London is safe. Emotionally, it was incredibly distressing and draining, and even though people weren't in London, the grief of London was felt by all of us up there really painfully. Blair flew back to London to deal with the terrorist situation. There was then some uh, disagreement just quite about who would chair the summit, how that would play out. And then there was the day of the outcomes summit itself. So the summit and um, negotiations led, led on to the eighth, where there was the, the famous communique of the Labour Union's promise that came out on the eighth. Uh, Laurie called me to let me know that the AIDS language that we'd been fighting for had got in. Uh, and the Stop AIDS campaign that I was the manager of at that time was mostly a student mobilisation. So it was incredibly idealistic, incredibly passionate young people that I was able to relay this news to. And I hope they always feel as powerful as they did right then. So that sense of they fought for something really hard for a year and it has happened. But when you fight, you can win. You don't always, but when you fight, you can. And um, so we relayed that news to them and then there was the final uh, community coming out publicly. Um, I was then involved in negotiating the sector's response to that. I'm really glad I'm getting this off my chest. I'm so uh, emotionally invested in this. Uh, there was a negotiation amongst the sector about what we were going to say about these historic results for the poor and these historic results for Africa. And over the course of that negotiation, it became very clear that some people had decided what they felt about the outcome before there was an outcome. It became increasingly clear that some people had, as an article of political faith, held the idea that failure is motivating. And if I feel one thing as an activist, it is the idea that that is the most pernicious, dangerous idea that a campaigner can hold. So the lessons of this period for me are 
threefold. Number one, it is incredibly short-termist and counter to human psychology to believe that telling someone that they've worked on something for a year, they've believed in this more than they believed in anything, they've worked harder, fought harder, and won bigger than they ever have in their life. To tell them that they have failed is the one thing that they will ensure that they never take action again. So this idea that partial failure, that it wasn't that good, we could have got more, is motivating, it just runs totally counter to how we are as people. If you work hard, you want to know that your efforts have delivered results. On top of that, it was just intellectually true that their efforts had delivered results. And that's what we should have said. But we didn't because we took this short-term view that somehow that would demotivate people and make people think they should fight again. I think that's completely the wrong call. I think we make people ready to fight again by saying that fighting makes a difference. Lesson number two is we were incredibly arrogant. So we thought the world was waiting for the view of Make Poverty History, that all our supporters were waiting for emails from individual charities and agencies as if somehow by becoming a development activist you are incapable of watching the television or reading a newspaper. It was profoundly arrogant. Actually, the media took a view on the outcome of this summit well before we did. So we were sat in a room fighting about just how bad we said it should be, while Stephanie Sanders was already on the television with her high degree of trust and rapport with her viewers, saying this was a historic outcome. So by the time we got our conclusions out, the public had already heard the conclusions from experts, and the conclusions were that it was good. So we were incredibly arrogant, incredibly short-termist. And there's one lesson above all of this for me. It's that politics works. Now, I don't care if you're a partisan in politics between parties. That's not my business. I don't care if you're a partisan in politics, but we must all be partisans for politics. We must all defend the right of elected leaders to lead and we must all stand up for our ability as citizens to help lead them towards the form of leadership that we would like. The lesson we want to teach you above all for me is that leaders do have the power to make the difference and we do have the power to make them. But if we ourselves don't believe that, it will never work. If we don't believe that change can happen, change will never happen. Um, just a couple of extra things on, on that and how it was all judged. Um, one thing is, for, for people who don't know, I mean, Blair did come down to London after the bombings, but he also came back um, to Glen Eagles and, and finished the summit. Um, I, I, I agree with what Kirst is saying about you know, the importance of actually celebrating um, success rather than failure. I, I think that's true for activists. I think, actually, politicians, I think, are, are amazingly thick-skinned about this. So after the summit, Justin and I talked to Blair about did we need to try and communicate or in some way with all of these people who had signed a petition to us um, directly and then and Blair was pretty sanguine, he just said, you know, this is this is the way stuff happens, don't be so surprised kind of thing. But I do think a lesson for campaigners is that actually a lot of this stuff um, gets done by bureaucrats and you bureaucrats also need to feel like the work that they're putting in makes a difference because um, uh, it was a lot of work and it was it was pretty hard to imagine what was the thing that we hadn't done um, so uh, you know I think it's I think that speaks speaks for the for the negotiators as well as for the um, uh, as well as for the um, uh, the activists um, and um, yeah I know for you know, for me, because we spent so much time with the the, the main poverty history people, their, their judgment was the one that kind of made the meant the most to, to us. So even though as bureaucrats, you saw the media and all that kind of thing, um, it was those people you'd spent all those negotiations with that you wanted um, to 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 believe in what you achieved. And um, yeah, I think that makes it just more difficult uh, next time around that um, the response was so muted. Yeah. Nonetheless, against the odds, we're still friends. Uh, so, uh, and we remain friends through the aftermath. So, this is just the final two minutes of what happened next. So, in the aftermath, Make Poverty History was always intended to be a year long campaign because of the G8, but also the EU presidency that ran through those six months, but also there was a world trade in cereal later in the year. Um, I promised you when I emailed about this event, I was going to tell you about the world's worst stunt heroes. 
uh, campaigns had decided that you should do something themed to each country. Uh, so in Scotland, there's obviously lots of Jenny bonnets, if you like, uh, and people do things. So in um, Japan, the Muji there, there was the kind of insight then hope lanterns and things that were culturally appropriate for the environment that we were in. The World Trade Ministerial was a believe in Hong Kong at that point, so it was decided that the culturally appropriate stunt we should do was have a giant fortune cookie, which would spring open, uh, and there would be people's banners who would emerge. So we ordered a giant fortune cookie big enough to hold campaigners, which, if you think about it for a moment, is a giant flesh-coloured <laughs> which we haven't thought about until it's been moment of delivery. So that, that, that's one got cancelled. I don't think that's what made the treatment to be a real failure. But it certainly yeah. If you'd have done it, it would have made it a failure. <laughs> but it certainly meant that we, uh, we missed a chance to influence it. Um, and then after the ministerial, we, we shut down. And just to say two things on that. Uh, Make Poverty History was designed to be a year-long campaign. It was hardwired into the strategy from the beginning that we build the list, then burn the list. So it hurts me, but we built the list. We built the biggest anti-poverty mailing list in the British history, and then we burnt it. I'll say that again. We built the biggest anti-poverty mailing list in British history, and then we burnt it. But that was an accident. Someone didn't wipe the disc. We burnt it on purpose. And the reason for that was twofold. Now, whether you agree that this is the strategy, Sold up for grabs to the one thing. But uh, we did burn it strategically. And the strategic reason for that was twofold. First of all, because some organisations that we did require, so when Laurie talks about the, the breadth of the campaign, uh, we, there were some organisations we dealt with that we didn't actually require in retrospect, but there were some that we did require who demanded this as part of their price of entry that we required the list. And that was viewed to be a price worth paying, but they were so strategically necessary that it was worth paying. And secondly, it was felt at the outset of the campaign that if we didn't keep it tight to 2005, we wouldn't be able to leverage all the sense of the window of opportunity shutting. So that's why we did it. I say you'll have your own view about whether that was the sense or not. Um, the big lesson from this period for me is we as a movement have not evaluated our failures on trade. So we didn't succeed in getting change for that trade ministerial, and we haven't succeeded in getting significant change towards trade justice since despite several years of campaigning and several hundred thousand pounds we spent on the campaigning, we haven't evaluated that enormous strategic failure, and for me that's strategically unforgivable. We have to work out why we failed if we're to prevent that level of magnitude of failure again. So we'll do that in the future, hashtag change history talk. So look out for the invite to that. So we do have to have that reckoning as a movement, but we didn't at the time. Uh, I'll be very quick. So, um, trade, as you say, uh, wasn't really done. Um, I, I think the potential lesson is that the GA is just not a great venue for trade negotiations. I mean, for years and years it had said the right thing about trade negotiations, but it never fed into the WTO, because you just don't have all of the right players there. China, India, Brazil, for example. Um, although some of those were invited to uh, the Eagles as well. Um, um, and then, of course, you know, um, the window of opportunity on trade was lost shortly afterwards um, with the, you know, the global economic crash and Doha round died and everything. I also think there's a, you know, there is another lesson which is po possibly a harsher one for us all to reflect on, which is that, in a sense, aid is the cheap bit of development. Um, that's the bit that rich countries are relatively willing to afford. Changing their trade rules has much, much bigger impact, and they're just less willing to do it. Uh, I mean, I think the UK is relatively progressive on this, but um, the EU has a mixed record, and um, uh, and it's just much, much harder, much, much harder. The, the other thing that we, we tried to make sure happened our, afterwards was that there were some uh, accountability processes to follow up on all of these promises. Um, and we tried one thing, sort of somewhat government-sponsored, which was the Africa Progress Panel, which was chaired by Kofi Annan. And then Data, uh, which is now one, of course, um, started producing its annual data reports to track um, how, it, how, how uh, progress was going. And um, I think, for a variety of reasons, the data report was much more focused on tracking whether Glen Eagles had really, uh, you know, the, the promises had been delivered. The Africa Progress Panel um, uh, 
evolved into something slightly different um, um, and uh, started looking more at you know what are the new things that are start, starting to affect Africa, interesting things like land and, and tax and that kind of stuff. Um, so it was probably good that we hedged our bets in terms of accountability frameworks um, and the data reports have, have really helped in terms of tracking the progress that we've made. Right, so now I've got all that for test. Uh, does anyone have any do that before you share. So you're going to use this to call it time down lunch. Thanks for that. That was I think that was my favourite lunchtime talk. Um, my question was more about how you communicated back to supporters. I remember actually sitting with my mum watching the TV and being like, I haven't said anything on trade, mum. Because that was the one thing for me. I was like, why are they doing anything on trade? What, going back to the very start of when we got organisations to sign up, was there um, a conversation about what success, success would look like at the end? So was that where, it, where things fell apart? Or did, did like the Oxfam's and Save Children's at that time say, actually, we want debt cancelled completely, we want this on trade, we want this on... Um, aid, or was it a case of the conversation happened at the very end and it was all a bit messy? Uh, that's a great question. Should we take two or three at a time? Who wants that one? Thanks. Um, God, there was loads in there, so I've probably got a, a few questions. Um, working on the Action 2015 campaign, obviously, a lot of this is kind of really useful to hear, and there was just a, a couple of things I wanted to ask about. One was just a bit more on the kind of the burning the list um, approach at the end. Was there kind of more of a, it would be good to get a bit more background on that and the kind of strategic conversations behind that. Was there kind of an assumption that the people, not so much burning the list, but that people would gravitate towards different organisations and would therefore kind of support more specific causes or was it literally like, okay, let's just see what's happened. And the second one on that kind of point as well was the kind of the funding point for the, for the campaign, like how much of an issue was that in terms of what organisations contributed in terms of resources. And just the last point was, um, obviously in, in 2005 it was less, I guess, um, social media and the kind of digital side was not as big then. And in your thoughts on how that impacts kind of campaigning in the future and how you can get that balance between people on the streets and people online. Sorry, that's three. Okay. And then, did you have one? Everyone. Thanks for inviting some of us who aren't safe staff to be here. It's a fascinating conversation. So the scars will be open to the end. Um, Laurie, you talked a lot about how um, you were meeting with a small group of representatives from the campaign. Can you, but one of the things we've talked a lot about, one of the kind of myths or one of the truths that kind of has come out of the industry, is that we built this coalition of 500 organisations so diverse, broad, it had the WI, the unions, as well as faith organisations, as well as the kind of core um, kind of campaigning NGOs. Can you talk a little bit about how much there was an awareness within? Number 10 within government, and this wasn't just the usual suspects, it was a much broader sense of that, mm -hmm. and how much that gave us leverage to the world choice. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think we were aware. Um, I mean, I think the who was in that negotiating group was carefully chosen, so I, I'm starting to try to remember the precise details, but I'm pretty sure there was someone from one of the unions who was kind of there to represent that family. I think maybe for the church groups too. Um, and then I think most of the rest were from relatively traditional um, development NGOs, but definitely, as I was sort of saying earlier, reflecting the spectrum of views. Um, so that it was, yes. Nevertheless, it was still a practical number. I mean, it was like, I can't remember, like seven or eight. It was, you know, you could have a conversation. It worked. Right, so the question about um, how did we make the issues align across the year and burning this actually come back to the same answer, which is strategically at the beginning of the year we had three objectives, make policy change happen, popularise our issues and strengthen the sector. The strengthening the sector slash vested interests piece took different ways at different points in the year. So the, the reason I was on the board was representing a network, so I uh, ran the Stop Peace Coalition, the trade justice movement as a coalition was represented on the board and the Jubilee Debt campaign as a coalition 
was on the board alongside some of the biggest agencies that we needed to have to make things work. The presence of the networks was there to represent Objective 3, that there was pre-existing sector infrastructure that we shouldn't undermine. However, the hard wiring in of that network infrastructure meant that there were internal pressures to talk about all three issues, or four if you count eights, all of the issues all of the time and all of the moments with all of the people, even though some of the moments we were speaking had nothing to do with trade. The strength of TGM on site board meant that that pressure came through quite strongly. So was that question about why were we talking about trade at the wrong time relates to the design. Of, the design was intentional and strategic, so it wasn't like anyone was misbehaving. We did that on purpose. Um, and it relates to burning the list that some of the, some of the people who were uh, necessary for the campaign just wouldn't have come on if we said that we weren't going to do that, unfortunately. And, the, and that comes from the same point of wanting to strengthen the sector and leave the standing infrastructure of the sector stronger. So there was a hope that everyone would funnel off to individual organisations. In reality, they didn't. But that was certainly our, our fervent prayer that they would, but they, they didn't. And um, the question about the funding, uh, the main organisations all pitched in, but actually the thing that was priceless was the gifts in kind that, again, were only possible because of our increased partnerships with Bob Boyle and Richard Curtis. So we couldn't have priced the degree intelligence exposure we got through the Vicar of Dibley. We could not have priced Bob did up in his usual understated negotiating way, um, a sort of 10 minute meeting with all the major advertisers saying, This is how much you're going to give this for free. Thanks, bye. Um, <laughs> less negotiation, more construction. Um, but those powerful players were so persuasive, again, really priceless gifts in kind that we probably could have got in every just in front of Yeah, I just want to start at the point. Thank, thank you for Kirsty and Laurie. But it's funny because 10 years ago, it just flies back. I've kind of forgotten most of it. I think I even have got on the stories about AIDS and AIDS the wrong way around about the, what actually happened. So sorry for the observer on Sunday. They thought that was wrong. I was wrong. Every story has many, many sides. I just wanted to make two points that reinforce what our Laurie and Kirsten said. One is, I think these were the most amazing, I've been in a lot of G8 and G20 negotiations um, now over the years, from the inside and quite a lot from the outside. These were the most amazingly complicated negotiations. And what worked really well wasn't just the negotiations with, um, between in a way with governments and then with NGOs going on in parallel on substance, but on tactics and strategy. So the reason that, um, as Laurie said, there was I mean, basically Blair and Brown made the decision to keep so much open to the last minute was because the campaign was hitting very late, particularly live aid, more than even make already history, but both together. But there were lots of individual examples of that pressure. I remember Bono coming into number 10 and talking to the GEA Sherpas at one particular moment and really challenging and trying to move them personally and individually about what their personal responsibility and what their grandchildren would think of them if they didn't deliver. Those kind of very coordinated pincer movements on individuals, as well as the big grand things like the marches in, in Edinburgh were really, really important. And you know, why um, it could be pushed right to the wire. I mean, I remember when actually um, Tony Blair came back from London after the bombs and he literally, you know, got Schroeder in the toilets downstairs by the bar and twisted his arm behind his back to get him across the line was because of all of that pressure going on outside. And I do think, you know, there are lessons about, um, you know, today and then in terms of extremism and because in a way, all the leaders of the world lining up after the terrorist attacks and saying our answer to terrorism is our values and our values as what we've done today on poverty actually a very important message and that also resonated with the public. There was a much bigger thing going, 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 going on here. Um, the other point I wanted to make is other than people feeling personally hurt, I think, on both sides about some of the last minute tactical decisions, I think the real lesson on that is something slightly different which you hinted at, Kirsten. And Bob, I think, put it very well, which is, you know, you can't march all your people to the top of the hill and march them all down again with, the ta with their tails between their legs, especially when they have won. And I think, you know, having 
you know, been involved in the first meetings of May probably he's been then going and working for Tony Bay on the other side with Laurie. I, I think the NGOs were at the most powerful moment ever in history with the G8 five minutes before the agreement. And then they were at their lowest moment ten minutes after and, and, and didn't really recover for five, maybe even ten years since then. Because if the NGOs had collectively said, actually we got seven out of ten, which I think is probably the fair outcome for Glen Eagles, rather than as we walked across the lawn, um, Tony Bell, I remember asking me and Laurie from the, from the actual room to the press conference, which was in a tent, you know, what they said was that some people are saying this is a disaster for the world's poor, this agreement, looking at us and going, <laughs> what planet are they on? Um, I think in that moment, we both just made politicians, there was a kind of break of trust with politicians, but there was also a break of trust with the public that had mobilized. And I think, uh, you know, if you'd said, if the NGOs had said this was a victory, actually, in the coming years, to hold politicians to account for the delivery of what had been achieved would have been unbelievable power. Actually, NGO power after Glen Eagles would have been stronger. This is actually the real insight from Bono. The reason that Bono had so much influence over George Bush is he, in the early days, went into the White House and walked out and did that. And then Bush basically owed him something forever. And he kept on calling on that. If the NGOs had said success, they would have had unbelievable power to say, well, actually, you're not delivering on the success for the years after they did. And I think that is a big, you have to do the, the, the positive, not just the negative. Having said that, I don't think it's the end of the world. And I think the NGO movement, I really don't. I think it was an amazing success. And the Make Body History is an extraordinary campaign. And you need some of this tension sometimes. Things that life isn't simple. And um, it was mainly a success. Any other questions? I part of the sun. Make sure we take some from me. Thanks. Um, so I started working for Oxfam in 2007, and having not been involved in make body history, it kind of feels like this sort of thing that gets venerated, uh, and that in a way it's always 2005, and that too often quite a lot of campaigns try and replicate the success of it. So I was just wondering if you could say a, a couple of things about like what is relevant lessons for what we're trying to do now in terms of Action 2015 or, or other things, or you know which which bits, which lessons have been learned correctly or incorrectly, and, and what should we take from what happened then as we try and think about it in the future? Okay. Um, okay. 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 Thanks, Kirsty. And, and David Taylor from Oxfam, just to echo what Tom said, it's great that you opened this out to us and really grateful to all the insights I had. I just have a question about in terms of putting pressure in different capitals. Ten years on, what do you think we as a sector should have done differently or better. I mean, a lot of us have, I know you, both your organisations do have offices in different capitals, so there's also we have a number of affiliates. I don't get the sense that there is the strength movement that we have in the UK, and I wonder what we could have done differently or could do differently to, to make that, uh, to change that in the future. Okay, so one more. No, okay. Um, do you want to answer this question? Um, in terms of that first one about getting NGOs thinking about the other countries, I don't know, I mean, Kirsty may know whether or not that was one of these preconditions that you identified you needed or wasn't, and so maybe if it wasn't, that was a, that was a lesson, that one of the things that you definitely need is people who were going to, you know, mobilise in all eight countries, not just in the UK, um, so that might be a lesson. I think, um, um, and you know some of the international NGOs could do that, but actually in, in each of the other G8 capitals, you probably need a couple of the more local ones who are actually bigger in their own country than, than, than the other NGOs are. Um, so I think that probably is a lesson. It's not an easy one. I mean, you've got a few of these big, more global structures that bring NGOs together, of course, like Cyprus, which you know were there. And, and, um, but, uh, I mean, I think if anyone really does think that Glen Eagles could have achieved more, it would have been by the rest of the G8 
countries be willing to do more? I don't think it was much to do with what more the UK was willing to push for. So that probably would be um, that lesson, I think. Um, which I think is definitely one of the lessons you're trying to learn, Zander, in what you're doing now is uh, you know, not allowing these things to only be in one country. Um, I think, you know, the thing about do you want to try and be mainstream or not, that Kirsty talks a lot about, is clearly really crucial. Um, and um, uh, wasn't easy and, um, you know, was um, a shame that more of that wasn't, wasn't held, uh, held on, although I agree with Justin that you know, it's complicated. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, it showed, you know, Kirsty talked at the beginning about, you know, stars aligning. I mean, you do have to make the mo most of those moments. Um, uh, and, uh, and you know, that's partly to do with all sorts of things, but it, it's partly to do with the absolutely fundamental requirement in big negotiations is a deadline. If you have a deadline, you will never stop talking, which is what killed the trade routes, basically. Um, so sometimes, you know, but most deadlines are created in some way. They're, they're, not, they're not real, because of course life carries on after the, after the deadline. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's one of the things, is trying to create those, create those moments and those deadlines. And um, we're a reasonably natural one, I guess, with September in 2015 and that kind of thing. But, uh, but obviously that's why it's important that that sets a new deadline in 2030 really, really strongly. Why that's going to be a really big, big deadline that we can set in the future. Thanks. On the, um, on the kind of, uh, international nature of the mobilisation, I think there was two failures. One was we didn't have intelligence to other capitals. So it wasn't just we didn't have pressure in other capitals. It's that we didn't understand who really governments were. And this is one of the things that um, sometimes I think campaigners uh, get confused about when we talk about why access to government is important. It's not just because access to government and decision makers helps you influence them. And if you don't think you are capable of exercising any interpersonal influence, then like pack up and go home, frankly. I mean, I, I rate my ability to persuade people quite highly. And if you don't, don't be a campaigner. Um, so it's partly that access does help influence, but it also helps you gather intelligence. And actually, on both those fronts, the campaign failed. And we were very dependent on Bob Bono information government from uh, other actors rather than in terms of coalition and getting intelligence from other capitals but also exercising the influence in those other capitals and I think the only way around that is really significant investment um, in other places in both of those capacities, the ability to gather intelligence and the ability to exert pressure. Um, Sandra, your question I think is probably the right one to leave it on which is what is the single most relevant lesson and for me it's the same lesson from big property history as there was from Turn Up Save Lives, as there was from Restart the Rescue, as there was from all of the really significant changes that we've achieved under governments of all sorts of different complexions. And it's this, that the public make things possible, but politicians make them happen, and the dynamic interplay between the two is where the real magic happens. So mobilisations that don't have a plan for how actually policy processes can be bent towards justice and don't have a relationship building strategy of how the people who control those policy processes might want to bend it towards justice are just shouting the wind. So mobilisation without a strategic plan for influence won't get you anywhere, but relationships without the pressure won't get you anywhere either. So it's the dynamic relationship between the two that really makes these extraordinary things that we talked about happen, uh, we talked about at the beginning. It's that which makes those things happen. And this debate will run. It has to say it's been running all week. It was the anniversary of Line 8 yesterday. It's the anniversary of the actual outcomes on the 8th. And you know, the still burns really deep and the fights are really big. But I'm a desperate partisan inside that fight. I stand very firmly on one side. I don't think we should let anyone tell us it didn't work. It did work. The mobilisation made the difference and the policy then made the difference. So people made a difference to policy, and then policy made a difference to people. And we shouldn't let anyone tell us otherwise, because ultimately, the, the big thing from the history for me is this, that there are people alive today whose faces we will never see and whose names we will never know, but who are alive because, and only because, you demanded that that be so. 
that people pay together and said enough is enough, the way things are is not the way they have to be, and it's not a way that we find it tolerable that they continue to be. And if anyone thinks that doesn't work, I suggest you go have those conversations with the people who are on ARVs, whose kids are sleeping under bed nets, whose kids have been immunised against killer diseases, and whose kids are alive today who would otherwise be. So never, ever let anybody tell you it doesn't work. It did work. It will continue to work. You should be very, very proud.